Hello, and welcome to the first of my lectures for my class on psychological testing and assessment. That is PSYC 770, which I'm teaching in the fall semester of 2016 at North Dakota State University. Um, before I get started with the first lecture, a little bit of humor, albeit rather nerdy humor. This is a uh, cartoon from the great web comic series xkcd.com. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, you absolutely should check it out. It's the best. And um, obviously what's being referenced here is the famous Turing test, which you might be familiar with if you've read anything about the life of Alan Turing, or if you've seen the movie The Imitation Game, or even more recent kind of sci-fi movies like Ex Machina. Um, so you may be familiar with it already. If you're not, go read those books and see those movies. They're really good. Anyway. This is my first lecture, like I already said. So um, <clears throat> today what I'm going to do is just rather uh, generally introduce the, uh, the nature and the use of psychological testing. I'm also going to talk a little bit about what my class involves. So if you're enrolled for the class, you'll have a sense of what you're in for. If you're not enrolled in the class and you've just stumbled onto this lecture on YouTube, then, uh, well, welcome, and some of this stuff won't apply to you, but if you stick with it, you'll get to some stuff that I think will be interesting, and certainly in future lectures, I think there'll be a lot of stuff that's interesting. So like I said, we'll begin by talking a little bit, or I'll begin by talking a little bit about the class, why I think you should take it, where some of the topics that we're going to cover, etc., how I'll handle grading, then I'm going to introduce psychological testing, um, the idea of testing, some of the uh, ways that testing can play an important role in our lives. I'm going to talk a little bit about the distinction between uh, testing and assessment. I'll talk briefly about different types of tests, and uh, this part of the lecture will function as a bit of a preview for the rest of the semester because in subsequent lectures in the different weeks and uh, units of the class as we go on in the semester I'll be focusing on ability tests, uh, you know, achievement tests, personality tests, neuropsychology tests, etc. And I'll finish up by talking a little bit about some of the uses of testing. Again, this is really only meant to be a preview or perhaps a bit of a teaser, a bit of an incentive for you to pay attention both to this lecture and to the subsequent lectures, especially if you're enrolled in the class. Uh, hopefully you'll see some stuff there that will be interesting. Uh, you'll see some of the ways that testing can be useful to you in your clinical work or in your research work or even just in your, your life. Okay, so about the class, what's involved here? Well, I think you should take this class for a number of different reasons. Um, I think it will provide a broad overview of psychological testing. It'll introduce some interesting and important concepts, some of which you may know from other classes, things like reliability and validity and so on. Um, but you'll see them through the, uh, the lens or from the perspective of testing. I'll talk a little bit about <clears throat> a couple different forms of test theory, that is the kind of psychometric theories which underlie the tests which we use in psychology. And I'll talk a little bit about test development. Now, the, this may be especially interesting to you if you are interested in uh, developing tests for your research work. If you're developing a, a new questionnaire or measure of some construct, um, I'll try and touch upon the basic uh, process that most uh, test developers use when they develop a new measure. And I think that's interesting probably to all psychologists, especially those who are, uh, desire to develop their own measures for their research purposes or maybe even for their clinical purposes. If you're enrolled in this class at NDSU, uh, you'll have some practice administering specific tests that will be taking place in class, of course not online, but uh, you should take this class if you're interested in learning and getting some practice with actual uh, ability and achievement and personality and neuropsychological testing. And by the end of the semester, uh, you'll get some practice putting together uh, elements of test results into an integrated report, something which most uh, good clinical psychologists should be able to do. So we'll talk about the basics of assessment writing, you know, integrating information from multiple tests and creating a hopefully coherent and uh, clinically useful 
picture of a particular client's functioning and maybe even prognosis for future functioning. So I've already said a couple times broadly what the class will involve. Let me break this down now and talk about the particular units that the class involves. Um, each unit is roughly a month long or so and it encompasses a certain uh, period of weeks. Unit one, I'm just calling Introduction to Psychological Testing. Here's where I will talk a little bit about the history of psychological testing and some of the current uses of psychological testing. I'll also try and touch upon some of the implications and the ethics of testing. I'm going to try and talk about the ethics of testing repeatedly across the semester, but I think it's important almost right off the bat, indeed in the next lecture, the one that follows this very lecture, to begin introducing the important uh, ethical uh, questions that must be raised when we do testing, especially psychological testing testing. In Unit 1, partly just because they, they're interesting in and of themselves and partly because they're useful to talk about as a way of understanding other concepts in Unit 1, I'm going to introduce a couple brief clinical instruments. These are um, questionnaire uh, self-report instruments which are useful for assessing um, various aspects of psychological functioning. The Beck Depression Inventory uh, second edition is one that almost all psychology students are probably familiar with. It measures, of course, uh, some aspects of depression. The Symptom Checklist 90R is maybe somewhat less familiar, but it is more or less what it sounds like. It's a uh, checklist that uh, asks questions about different symptoms for major uh, axis one psychopathology and talking about them again is interesting uh, for their own sake but they're also interesting because they allow us to um, kind of look at or consider different concepts which are important in unit one in this introduction to psychological testing. So what are those concepts? They're things like reliability and validity which you've almost certainly encountered before in other psychological uh, classes or psych classes like psychological research methods or even statistics classes. I'm also going to talk about sensitivity and specificity which are um, useful ways of thinking about how we interpret the results of tests especially with respect to decision making. Um, you know, do we, how good is a test at detecting a particular disorder and so on. I'm also going to introduce um, a couple elements of psychometric theory, particularly so-called classical test theory, um, which is really the foundation, as you might guess from its name, for much of how we think about testing in psychology. And I'm also going to talk about the so-called new rules of measurement, um, newer perspectives on psychometric theory that emerge from uh, item response theory and other related modern data analytic techniques. Uh, we're not going to get into those too deeply, but I will try and talk about them a little bit. They're covered in the textbook that I have assigned for this class, and I think they're important to understand uh, even if you don't, well, you might use them if you're doing your own uh, test development, but, but even if you don't ever use them, it's, I think it's important to un understand a little bit about them. In addition, and kind of as I've already mentioned, in Unit 1 we'll be talking about test construction, how tests, at least most tests, most of the tests that we'll be looking at, are developed and kind of uh, set up, how we come to have a particular set of questions on our brief clinical instruments or a particular set of puzzles or problems on an ability test or an intelligence test and so on. Unit 2 will cover tests of ability and achievement. These are tests that you may be more familiar with as intelligence tests or relatedly tests of knowledge that you have, your achievement in particular areas of study. Um, in order to talk about this, of course, I'm going to have to talk quite a bit about some of the major theories of intelligence. And I'm also going to introduce a couple major tests uh, of ability or intelligence and of achievement, particularly the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale and the Wexler Individual Achievement Test. In Unit 2, I'll try to introduce a few more key concepts. One of them that I want to focus on, because it's important, is the concept of test bias, uh, the extent to which the way a test is constructed or the way it's administered leads to decisions which systematically work to the advantage 
or disadvantage of a particular group of people, perhaps a particular uh, members of a particular gender group or particular uh, racial or ethnic category. Um, this is uh, clearly an important issue and it comes up a lot when we talk about testing, especially testing in school settings. Moving on to unit three, we'll have tests of personality and psychopathology. Um, here I'm going to introduce some of the major theories of personality, at least the ones which clinical psychologists are, are typically the most concerned with, and I'll introduce a couple major tests of personality and psychopathology. The MMPI-2, RF, um, which probably some of you are already familiar with as a test that measures some aspects of personality functioning within the normal range, but also a number of different features of uh, abnormal psychology, and also the NEO-PIR, so the, uh, a more uh, mainstream test of normal personality. In unit three, I'm going to try to introduce a few more key concepts, including the treatment utility of assessment, that is the extent to which an assessment uh, process gives us information about a client uh, or about a test subject that goes above and beyond the information we might already have about that person. And also the kind of debate between the use of clinical and actuarial prediction, the extent to which uh, clinicians in making decisions rely on their intuition, their gut feelings about a particular client, or the extent to which they uh, rely on data from formal testing and assessment procedures. Moving on to unit four, we've got tests of neuropsychological functioning. So these are tests which uh, traditionally and in current practice are typically used to measure aspects of uh, psychological functioning which are closely related to brain areas which are well understood neurobiologically. Um, of course, arguably, all aspects of psychology are grounded in the biology of the brain, but there are particular tests which are good for understanding areas of dysfunction in particular regions of the brain, and we usually group these together as neuropsychological tests. So to talk about these, I'm going to have to introduce some of these structures in the brain and elsewhere in the nervous system and some of their functions, and I'm going to have to introduce a few major tests which I think are important and interesting to know about. Our neuropsychological tests, the R-bands, the TOVA, and the WIMS, that's the Wexler memory scale, it's part of the Wexler set of tests, and we'll get some chances to talk about them and practice with each of them so that you have a good sense of what a neuropsychological assessment may involve. So we're covering all sorts of information across this semester from introduction to tests of ability and achievement, tests of personality and psychopathology, tests of neuropsychological functioning. It certainly seems ambitious just reviewing it right now with you. Um, in the last unit of the class, we'll just try to put it all together and talk about the process of integrating information from multiple tests, from multiple sources, into a coherent assessment report, the kind of a core feature of the psychological assessment process. Um, I'll also try to cover in this unit other just interesting stuff which I haven't had a chance to get to earlier in the semester. If you're enrolled in this class, uh, the text that I'm requiring uh, for you to read is the current version, which is the seventh edition of Robert Gregory's Psychological Testing, History, Principles, and Applications. It's a really good book. It's actually improved quite a bit since its last uh, edition. It's been somewhat more, uh, somewhat shortened and focused. Um, I like Gregory's writing style. Um, if you're enrolled in the class, you'll have a copy of the syllabus by now, and you can take a look at it. Um, I provide some links to where you can purchase this text or rent it. Um, the cost of textbooks can be quite high, and as a teacher, I'm aware of that, and I try to when possible, pick options for textbooks which are relatively less expensive. It's hard to do that in this class. Almost all the textbooks that I looked at were quite expensive. Uh, this one at least you can rent, and if you're uh, just taking this class, it's valuable to rent the textbook. You know, testing, um, there are advancements made in testing every year. Uh, although I keep old textbooks, I wouldn't actually recommend this habit to anyone else. It tends to be rather an expensive way to fill up a bookshelf. Um, if you're concerned about cost or if you just don't like to have a bunch of textbooks cluttering up your office, I would suggest renting this textbook. Um, reading it, whether you rent it or, or purchase it, uh, 
because it will help you to really understand what's going on uh, with my lectures and with our classes. I'm also recommending the current version, which is the fifth edition of Groth Marnett's Handbook of Psych Psychological Assessment. This is really less a textbook and more just a, a compendium of different tests, uh, current information about the history and uh, psychometric properties and applications of pretty much any psychological test you can think of. It's a, it's a handbook. It's a big, thick volume. Um, it's quite expensive. I, I don't require it because in the past when I have required it as a text, I, I feel bad about it because we don't get through all of it. It's, it's a long book. If you're interested in psychological testing, if you're going on in clinical psychology, it's not a bad book to have, but it's quite expensive. So you might want to, uh, if you can afford it, buy a copy or look into maybe getting an electronic copy of it, or um, I'll see if the library has it at NDSU. I have requested that they purchase it, but those requests aren't always heeded. Anyway, it's out there. It's a great book. If you want to look at my copy and you're a student in my class, you can borrow it. I think I might have the older edition, but you can certainly take a look and get a sense of what it's like. If you're enrolled in this class, uh, you can come talk to me during our actual class times. You can come talk to me at almost any other time. I, I usually try and make time to meet with students, but I do keep official office hours in the mornings on Monday and Wednesday during roughly the times that you can see on your screen right now. Um, again, stop by, ask questions. If you can't make those times or if you have a very pressing question or concern, email me or talk to me in class. I'll can find some other time to meet. If you're enrolled in this class, there is a Blackboard site for it. Blackboard is the um, sort of uh, a you know, learning management system, I think is the formal and rather awkward name for what Blackboard is, but it's this system that our university, of course, subscribes to, many other universities do, which creates portals for different classes that you can look at. Um, the Blackboard site for this class will involve, will include announcements, readings, um, homework assignments, other stuff that I find interesting as the semester goes on. I'll do my best to populate that site with lots of content and also provide opportunities for you to interact with me through that Blackboard site via um, discussion board forums and the like. If you're enrolled in this class, you're probably wondering how I'll handle grading. Um, Basically, I'll have unit exams. These will be outlined in the syllabus, which you should have by now. Um, basically, there are four of them, one for each unit. Um, the exam for the fourth unit is relatively small because it's just a short little unit at the end of the semester. There's no final cumulative exam for this class. Um, these lectures will cover information from the text and from, I'm sorry, these exams will cover information from the text and from my lectures. They will be administered in class. There will also be homework assignments and these are going to take place on an almost weekly basis throughout the semester. They're short, relatively short, sets of multiple choice questions which will be administered and graded through Blackboard, which will be kind of nice because they'll give uh, you who are enrolled in the class opportunities to test your knowledge of the material that we've covered in the lectures and in the texts and um, hopefully you can uh, you'll be learning and you'll be doing well on these homework assignments usually the way I handle this is I set up the multiple choice questions to allow uh, multiple attempts so you'll have a couple chances to do each homework assignment uh, so if you don't do quite as well as you'd like the first time around, you'll have at least one or two uh, other chances to improve your score. And across the semester, actually almost, well, I'm still tweaking the grading scheme, but the last time I, I sort of went through it, almost half of your total grade for this class will come from homework assignments, uh, which is by design. I want to allow students opportunities to um, get as good a grade as they can in the class, reflecting hopefully how much they're learning. And so I tend to, uh, as a total portion of all graded points, have a lot of points coming from homework relative to exams, relative to other, um, other elements of grading in the class. Speaking of other elements of grading in the class, there will be some in-class practice exercises. These will um, come from, uh, these will be uh, based on specific tests that we are learning, like the MMPI or the WACE and so on. Um, these are going to be graded. Um, I 
don't have in front of me the exact percentage of the total grade, but relatively speaking, they're a small portion of your grade. That is by design as well. I want to um, make these in-class exercises at least a little bit graded so as to incentivize your, your hard work and your attention, but I don't want to make them so hard that as you're learning how to administer the WIMS or the R bands or whatever else, you're really worried about destroying your grade if you make a mistake. Uh, In-class uh, work is designed to be relatively forgiving, or at least that's what I hope to do for this class. Then the last thing that is graded in this class is an integrated assessment report which will be due at the end of the semester. And how this will work is in each of the units of the class you will get a, a piece of information about a fictitious client. So in unit one I'll give you some information from a brief clinical instrument, um, probably the BDI2 or maybe also the SCL9DR. In the second unit I'll give you some information from a WACE and from an MMPI. In the third unit I'll give you some neuropsych information. So by the end of the semester you can write a report which integrates information across these different tests and presents a picture of this client which you could then pass along uh, to another healthcare provider or you could communicate to the client directly uh, assuming or imagining that this was in fact a real assessment. Okay well um, hopefully you don't have any questions at this point. Uh, if you do um, and you're enrolled in the class, uh, you can email me or talk to me actually during a class period. If you're just watching these videos on YouTube and you're not associated with the class, you can post comments or questions in the uh, comments area of YouTube. I try to keep up with all the videos that I put online and answer questions if I see them. Um, so anyway, if you have questions, ask them. If you don't, sit tight because now I'm going to introduce psychological testing or give yet more of a kind of a very general overview of what psychological testing is like, why we do it, some of the important issues that come up when we do it, and so on. Just pausing to have a sip of tea here because this is a lot of talking for me. Okay, before I get started, let's try something. I want you to think back as far as you can this is a psychology class, so let's try and think back to when we were children, maybe even before that, and try to remember all the tests that you've taken in your life. Just think for a moment. Do this seriously. Think for a moment about all the different tests of mental abilities that you've had throughout the course of your life from as early as you can remember to right about now. Well, you almost certainly don't remember it, but you may be familiar, especially if you've taken a good developmental psychology class or human development class, that when you were born, you were probably given an APGAR test or a similar test of neuromuscular functioning and kind of basic um, mental status. Throughout your infancy, you probably were given various developmental tests um, or even developmental disabilities tests. Um, I myself, you know, my wife and I have some young children and in the past couple of years uh, I've tried to pay attention to all the various questionnaires that we've been asked to fill out or all the various observational instruments that our doctor has used when she has met with us and, and had checkups with our children. And there are quite a few of them that takes, take place across infancy. In your childhood, this is stuff you may remember, you probably took some school readiness tests to see if you had the basic pre-reading uh, and pre-numeracy abilities that were going to be necessary for, for schooling. You may have taken learning disabilities tests at that time. Um, you may have also taken tests that might have been designed towards assessing whether or not you had um, a, a special aptitude within a particular subject, whether you were a gifted learner uh, or so forth. In adolescence or young adulthood, uh, in high school and college, you may have taken vocational interest tests, you know, the guidance counselor's office in your high school. You may have taken a test to give you suggestions about career paths to pursue. Um, you probably took a test like the SAT or the ACT, which was part of your college admissions process. Uh, you, of course, were taking throughout this time in your life all sorts of tests in the various classes you were taking in high school and later in college. 
And further on into adulthood, you were probably taking, or you may have taken job screening tests you know, to get particular types of careers. You may have had to take entrance tests or competency tests. You may have had to take security clearance tests. If you are, uh, uh, if you're dating someone or if you're preparing to become married, you might have taken uh, tests related to your compatibility with your partner. Um, you may have, uh, for reasons of work or even just reasons of personal interest, taken tests of your own personality, perhaps to learn more about yourself. As you get into later adulthood, you may have started to get neuropsychological tests tests that I have mentioned uh, briefly before, tests designed to assess different aspects of your brain's functioning, especially functioning in areas associated with cognitive abilities like attention and memory and so forth. You may have, in connection with those, uh, largely paper and pencil tests or kind of problem-based tests, also had uh, psychophysiological tests like ECGs or EEGs, uh, fMRI, and so on to measure different aspects of your psychophysiology, maybe especially how your brain was doing. Um, so you've been, if you make it to late adulthood, you've taken, you've taken throughout the course of your life an enormous number of different tests. And of course, at some point you're going to die and you will be judged by the deity of your choice or interest. And depending on your religious perspective, you may be evaluated or tested for whether you've led a good life or a bad life, and maybe even be given eternal happiness or eternal damnation, or perhaps reincarnation for another lifetime of testing, all depending on your religious perspective. So the point of all this, even the humorous note at the end there, is just to remind us something of something that we're probably aware of, but maybe we don't think about too often, which is that we take a lot of tests. If you're lucky enough to live at this point in history in a modern westernized society, you're taking a lot of tests throughout the course of your life. Now, most people take this testing for granted, and it's understandable. If you've been doing something for a really long time, you kind of stop paying a lot of attention to it. But it's important to think about testing because testing can have real consequences for how you lived your life and how you function in various capacities. Your selection for a particular school was almost certainly influenced by your test performance, especially things like college. Uh, whether or not you got into the school that you or the college that you wanted to go to probably had at least something to do with your scores on the SAT or the ACT. Your ability to get a certain type of job may have to do with the results of a particular aptitude test that you take. Um, whether or not your uh, healthcare providers detect diseases or injuries that you might have sustained or b become susceptible to may have to do with diagnostic testing. Um, you may, uh, as a consequence of your legal um, entanglements, have to uh, face legal judgments that have to do with different types of testing. So testing is out there. It's something that we do a lot and it can have some real and significant consequences in our lives. Um, and throughout the course of the semester, I'll try to link to various little um, news items that I've found or that students in my class have found that have to do with testing, how testing affects our lives. So that hopefully, if you're not already persuaded, you will see that across the semester that testing really is important, especially psychological testing, because of course, that's what we're teaching about, or at least that's what I'm trying to teach about. So with that in mind, the idea that testing is ubiquitous or nearly ubiquitous and important, let's try to define what a test is. Well, a test, for our perspective, is a standardized procedure that's designed to sample behavior in some way. And that could be sampling behavior by observing it, you're using a child behavior checklist and observing a child playing in a playroom and recording different aspects of her behavior. It could be behavior in terms of you're filling out, um, you're completing a math problem on an aptitude or an ability test. Um, and the test administrator is observing your ability to solve that problem. It may be uh, behavior in the sense of you're endorsing particular, particular opinions or preferences on a personality or an interest questionnaire. Um, what's important is that this behavior 
is then described in some way with categories or scores you know, based on your responses on the questionnaire based on the child's behavior in the classroom we assign that child or we assign you to a particular category a diagnostic group perhaps or we give you some sort of a score uh, on a personality trait you have a high level of one trait a low level of another a high level of some sort of uh, dimension of psychopathology a low level of another we're taking this behavior and in some way quantifying it and moreover we're quantifying it in almost all cases with respects to some sort of norms or standards for what's typical for the general population or the subpopulation that you're a part of now the work of this testing is sometimes done by a person called a psychometrician this is someone who has a specialty in psychology and in education and develops and evaluates psychological tests so uh, a, psych a psychometrician is someone whose whole job is to work on testing and um, you know it's funny the, the more I teach this class the more I think about testing and assessment the more I think that that might be a job that I would sort of like back in the day when I was in grad school I wasn't particularly fond of assessment I took assessment classes but they weren't my favorites uh, but as time goes by I've found a lot of interest in the topic and actually, uh, one of my old grad school friends now works for one of the large psychological testing companies, and her work is essentially as a psychometrician, developing new tests, uh, evaluating tests. So that work, the psychometrician, is the psychometrician's work. So in the last slide, I gave some basic features or aspects of the definition of testing. Let's try and take each one of them piece by piece or one by one. So I said the test is a standardized procedure. Um, what that usually means is that the, the, the administration of the test, the way it's deployed, uh, is relatively uniform across examiners and across examination settings. So how I administer and score uh, and evaluate the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale should be the same each time I do it for any particular client or across a series of clients and it should be the same as how you or some other professional administers that same test we shouldn't have individual idiosyncratic ways of doing the test we should strive as much as is humanly possible to be consistent across our own applications of the test across uh, between different administrators and across different uh, settings um, how we do this is almost always based on instructions in a test manual so any published test <laughs> should include a relatively detailed manual of how the test was developed and how it is deployed or administered and if there's really one rule <laughs> to take away from this whole class it's that when possible it should be almost always possible but when possible follow the instruction manual don't administer the test in your own special way, regardless of how much of an expert you think you are. Administer the test as you're told to by the instruction manual or by the trainer who trained you on this, hopefully based on his or her reading of the instruction manual. That way, there's the best chance that you will administer the test in a standardized way that's consistent with the ways <coughs> that other professionals administer the test. I said the test is a sample of behavior <coughs> well this is a, a sample of behavior that's interesting to us only to the extent that it, it allows us to make inferences about other behaviors I mean testing isn't just randomly observing uh, another person or asking random questions that are unconnected to something more important or more interesting the questions or the items on a particular test the tasks or puzzles or, or what have you are all there because they're related to something else that we're interested in uh, the performance that you have on the Wexler adult intelligence scale should be empirically related to some sort of other behavior which we deem to be the behavior of an intelligent person um, your performance on the SAT should be empirically related to your performance as a college student uh, and it is to some extent but not as much as many people think um, your performance or your responses on the Beck depression inventory should be empirically related to how depressed you are or maybe even your likelihood of meeting formal diagnostic criteria for major depressive disorder um, so again tests at least psychological tests or samples of behavior but they're samples of behavior that are chosen very specifically because they are related in theory driven 
uh, hypothesis consistent ways to other behaviors or other constructs of interest. Um, now, what's interesting to note here, just as a brief sidebar, is that those connections don't have to be obvious to the test taker, the person who's actually taking the test, answering the questions, or so on. They don't even really need to be obvious to the person who's administering the tests. They just have to be empirically true, at least based on what the psychometrician has determined in his or her research. And if what I've said just sounds a little bit vague, um, don't worry, because we'll get to this point later on when we talk about personality tests, and particularly when we talk about the MMPI. Now, the MMPI is a, a kind of an interesting test. I, I've already mentioned it. It encompasses aspects of personality, also aspects of psychopathology. Um, it historically has been uh, you know, much used and also to some extent much criticized because many of the items on it seem odd or unusual and don't seem to obviously have to relate to anything. So there used to be questions on the MMPI that were things like, I would enjoy uh, repairing a doorknob or I enjoy reading magazines about motorcycles. Things which don't seem to connect to anything that's particularly interesting beyond, I suppose, home repair or motorbikes, but don't seem to connect to psychopathology or personality, but which empirically do. Um, and in the past, there was a fair bit of controversy about this. Um, just one example, and I'll touch upon this later, is in 1965, the, there was a Senate subcommittee convened to investigate psychological testing. It was the House Special Subcommittee on Invasion of Privacy um, Committee on Government operations. And it was this committee that has series of hearings, not just about the MMPI, but more generally about psychological testing, um, because there were concerns that psychological testing could be a way to invade people's privacy. Um, this was a period of time in history, the, the mid-60s, where there was a lot of concern about government kind of reaching into people's lives, maybe even reaching into people's minds and under, you know, knowing their deepest secrets. And psychological testing, I think, came under a certain level of scrutiny because it seemed somehow mysterious and kind of uh, like Big Brother reaching in and controlling our lives. And, and during the course of these um, these hearings, I, I looked for the transcripts, but I couldn't find them online easily. There were questions about why particular MMPI items were on the test because they didn't seem to have to do with anything obvious to the uh, senators uh, about psychopathology or personality. And the answer that was offered by the test developers, the psychometricians, was, well, it's just empirically the case that these particular responses are related to particular, particular personality traits or to psychopathology. So anyway, the, be that as it may, I said that tests involve samples of behavior. They're not just random samples of behavior, they're purposive, uh, empirically derived samples of behavior, or theory consistent samples of behavior that are in some way uh, scored or, or categorized. So we use people's responses to various questions or puzzles or items or what have you <coughs> to make classifications or to develop scores. Um, which are then, again, important because they predict or are related to some other behaviors which we're interested in. You know, the Beck Depression Inventory is useful to us mostly because it gives us a way of measuring s at least some aspects of people's depression. Uh, the Beck Suicide Scale, likewise, is related to suicidality. We're often interested in the extent to which we can describe behavior or emotions or thoughts, or especially predict future emotions and thoughts and behavior. Within this idea of, um, of, uh, of categorization and scoring, there are a couple assumptions, one explicit and one implicit. And the explicit assumption here is that we can measure psychological variables. Now, um, if you disagree with that point, you, you know, you've picked an odd you know, video to watch at this, <laughs> at this juncture in your life. And maybe if you're a student, you've picked an odd area to go into psychology if you don't believe that we can measure psychological variables. But we can acknowledge that measuring psychological variables is tricky. These things are non-concrete. You know, we can't observe them in a relatively direct fashion as we can with many other phenomena in nature. Um, nevertheless, you know, throughout the history of psychology, various psychologists have argued that whatever exists at all exists in some amount. 
and that anything that exists can be measured. And, and likewise, we could say that we have this explicit assumption that psychological variables, things like depression or alexithymia or extroversion or intelligence or schizophrenia or, you know, um, memory deficits or whatever else, these things exist in nature. Uh, and because they exist, we should, in principle, be able to measure them. And the, the devil may be in the details, the, the details that the psychometrician has to work out and the trained clinician needs to be sensitive to, but at least in principle, we ought to be able to measure these things. That's the explicit assumption or an explicit assumption really of all testing, all psychological testing that is. There's also kind of an implicit assumption here that there are individual differences in most of these variables. You know, we're not, or I should say, we wouldn't be interested in a psychological uh, construct that was uniform across all people. Um, what we are interested in are psychological constructs across, that people differ on. Um, you know, I don't have the quote in front of me, but I know in some of my other classes I use a quote from a uh, history of psychology textbook which begins in the, the first page of the first chapter with the statement that the life sciences, including psychology, are the study of variation. So we believe that psychological constructs like intelligence, like extroversion, like alexithymia, like schizophrenia exist and that we can measure them. But we also believe that they vary in their presentation across people or even within people across time. And that these individual differences are important. They're useful for us. So everything exists in some amount and that the differences in these amounts are meaningful to understand. Now, along with these, uh, this idea, or these ideas that there are defining, that define testing, there are some cautions that really need to be made here. Um, one is that all testing involves error. Now, that's true of any uh, testing or really any measurement, because uh, we're talking here about measurement error. Um, so if you were to talk to a chemist or a physicist or a geologist, you know, people in the so-called hard sciences, he or she would hopefully say, yeah, you know, when we measure stuff, we know that we're always going to be a little bit off. That little bit off is the definition of measurement error. The difference between an observed score that we see on our scale, our ruler, our checklist, our whatever, and the real score, what that individual person or that individual rock or that individual photon or, or whatever really has on that measurement. So uh, observed score equals true score plus some error. You're either a little bit higher or a little bit low. Uh, we sometimes uh, kind of abbreviate this X equals T plus E. And this is a foundational idea in classical test theory, which I'll talk about a little bit later in this unit, in unit one. By the way, if you've taken classes with me before, or really probably if you've taken any classes in research methods or statistics, that equation might look a little familiar to you because it's similar to the model and error equation that we often encounter in kind of modern model comparisons type statistics classes. There we would say the data equals the model plus error. So the data being like the score for an individual person in our database, our, our matrix of values. Um, the prediction being what we think they ought to have and the error being the discrepancy between the two. Those two ideas of uh, measurement error and kind of our, our model comparison aren't exactly the same, but they're pretty similar. And they reflect that same basic idea, which is that anytime we measure or, or model, that is to say, describe or predict something, we're always a little bit off. And that's something which I think any serious scientist knows. I hope any serious psychologist knows, but it's worth kind of reminding ourselves of, because if we don't, we might lapse into the mistaken belief that if I measure someone's level of depression on my Beck depression inventory or their level of intelligence on my Wechsler adult intelligence scale, that I've somehow captured the true and perfect measure of that thing their depression, their intelligence. I haven't. I've captured a score which hopefully is related to whatever their true score is, but which necessarily will have some amount of error involved in it. And indeed, we often, well, we, if we're being serious about testing, and we should be serious about testing, we try to reduce error. So we can reduce error by developing good tests. You know, why do people who are psychometricians work so hard to develop just the right way of measuring memory or select just the right questions to 
measure depression or to measure extroversion? Well, they want to select the questions or develop the puzzles or problems that are going to be the best at measuring what we think the true thing is, the true construct is, and have the least amount of measurement error. And um, the clinicians who administer these tests also should be concerned about reducing error. They, they desire uh, or the motivation to, uh, to administer tests in a consistent standardized way comes out of the motivation to reduce measurement error. If I, every time I administer an intelligence scale, do it slightly differently and I'm somewhat haphazard about it, maybe I make it a little easier on clients who I kind of like, maybe I make it a little bit harder if I'm in a bad mood, well that's introducing more error into my measurements and I don't want that. At least I shouldn't want that. So we can reduce error by developing tests well and by administering them well, but we can never eliminate error. That's a, that's a, <clears throat> you know, that is the vanishing horizon that all science runs towards, the perfect measurement, and it just doesn't exist. Not for psychology and frankly not for any science. The only thing that's precise is pure mathematics and that's not what we're doing. Another kind of related idea is that we can never know error for any one individual. So as we'll see later in this unit, we can talk about error in a general sense, like uh, the way the error can be part of a measurement um, for a particular group of people or across a series of administrations. But if we have just one test score in front of us, it's difficult to know the precise amount of error for that one person. I've got a test score for this one individual and it's 12 on a scale of zero to 20. I don't really know how much of that 12 is error and how much of it is true score for that individual. I might know that in general with this test, there's a certain margin of error around any estimate I make. And knowledge of that margin of error is important because it, it allows me to uh, adjust my understanding or my confidence in how much I really want to believe this one person's individual score. But it's not like I can never know, aha, uh -huh, out of this 12 points, two of them were error, but 10 of them were true score. That, that's not how error works. We're not how we understand error in measurement. And I'll talk about that a little bit later if that point seems a little bit vague. Um, so caution, error exists. We have a hard time, uh, you know, we, we can reduce it. We can never eliminate it. We have a hard time really identifying it in very particular cases. We can talk about in general terms. Another caution is that we have to be careful about reifying the construct. And if that statement seems a little bit vague, let's, let's break it down for a second. Reify means to convert to or to regard um, something as a concrete thing, to make real, to make solid. And of course, a construct, at least construct the way most scientists, especially most psychologists use it, is really um, an idea, an abstraction that exists as a set of, of propositions that define a nomological network. So that's a mouthful. But uh, a construct might be something like intelligence or depression or extroversion or memory, something which doesn't exist in the outside world in a concrete way, uh, like the way the chair in my office does or the cup of tea in front of me does, but which I believe exists. But my understanding of its existence is necessarily bound up in a theory that I have about what intelligence is or what extroversion is or what schizophrenia is. And that theory, to pick any one of them, is itself a set of hypotheses, predictions about how someone with schizophrenia behaves under certain situations, or about the type of risk factors which predict schizophrenia, or the type of you know, brain dysfunctions which accompany schizophrenia, and so on. So the construct is an abstraction, not a, not a random abstraction, a hopefully well thought out, well articulated abstraction, but it can be reified meaning it can be made more real. And the way I'm thinking about this, the point I'm trying to make here is that constructs are useful working definitions. Like I just said, they're abstracts, they're abstractions. They're not real in a kind of quote unquote sense or in a concrete physical sense. But when we measure them, it sometimes, it somehow sometimes makes them seem more real than they quote really are. Um, 
you know, like intelligence is something that I think most people believe exists. And many people, probably most people would argue that folks vary in how intelligent they are, maybe for a specific areas of expertise, maybe even in a general sense, like some people are generally smarter and some people generally less so. Um, that's a belief um, that most people have. When we measure someone's intelligence, when we give them a score and say, you, sir, your score on my IQ scale is 100. You, ma'am, your score is 120. Uh, there's a danger or risk that we can make the difference between those two people realer than it really is. Um, how intelligent one person is relative to another is not uh, unknowable, but it is necessarily uh, somewhat abstract, maybe even somewhat vague. If you give two people numbers, it's very easy to just do the math in your head and say, oh, she is 20 points more intelligent than he is. Um, that realness, it can be misleading. Um, and you can see this all over the place. I mean, the internet abounds with silly personality questionnaires. Um, some of them are fun to do. I don't mean to be a crank about it, but it's very easy, uh, or it, it's very easy to notice if you read through the comment sections that sometimes accompany the websites for these different personality tests, how quick people are to categorize themselves as different from one another and often superior to one another or inferior to one another based on their scores. Like, oh, she's really high on that variable, but I'm really high on this variable. That type of talk, I think, reflects a slippage in thinking, a sloppiness in thinking, where we're taking constructs like intelligence, like personality traits, etc., which do exist and which can be understood scientifically, and we're acting like they're really easy to understand and they have a very obvious relationship or difference between, uh, uh, there are really obvious relationships or obvious differences between them. Um, and psychology, unfortunately, has a long and rather ignoble history of at times promoting uh, this kind of sloppy thinking. I mean, I'm proud of psychology and we'll talk about the history of testing, but there, there are ample cases throughout history of when psychological testing has led to really uh, mistaken and, and even prejudiced ideas about the relative intelligence of men as compared to women or the relative intelligence of white people as compared to black people. All horrible, unfortunate examples of reifying, making more concrete than is necessary or prudent constructs. So it's a rather long way of cautioning us, at least at this early stage in the class, for uh, over-interpreting, let's say, the results of our test, over-interpreting in a way that makes those measurements seem more concrete than in fact they likely really are. Now, to tie back briefly to what I did before, um, or what I was talking about before, a feature of pretty much all the psychological tests that we're going to talk about is that they are measurements of their samples of behavior which are measured and which are interpreted with respect to some sort of established norms or standards. Um, you know, if I said to you, oh, here's your score on my new test of, of intelligence is 14, probably the first question you ask is, well, how's 14 compared to the average? Is that above average? Is that below average? What's, what's the scale that we're talking about? Is it zero to 100 or zero to 15? because that makes a big difference to me. Um, you're asking whether you realize or not about norms and standards. And for the most part, we're really focusing on tests which have been developed by groups of psychometricians working very hard over many years in most cases um, with large samples from hopefully fairly representative populations. So we can say that if you have a score of 115 on this test, you are one standard deviation above what is the mean for the American population at roughly this point in history and so on. Um, these norms, uh, these standards, which should be published by the test uh, publishers, which should be part of the test manual but that you read before you administer a test, allow the test administrator to uh, interpret the results for an individual person. You know, where does this person lie with respect to what is typical for most people taking this test and so on. And as we'll see, the, these are not always easy distinctions to make and test uh, developers go to great lengths to try to find representative samples of the population and sometimes publish separate norms for different genders or different age groups or different 
racial or ethnic groups and so on because they don't want to uh, or they want to avoid misinterpretation of tests. Uh, interpreting a test for one person with respect to norms or standards that come from a population that that person maybe isn't part of. So complicated stuff, stuff we'll get to a little bit later on in, in the semester. Most of these tests, as I've said, are uh, that we're going to talk about at least are evaluated with respect to norms. Um, to be formal about this, we call these normed re norm referenced tests, where you, uh, you an individual score is interpreted with respect to uh, the scores that we have from a large and hopefully uh, representative sample, a so-called standardization sample for that test. Um, there are examples of so-called criterion reference tests. We're not going to talk about these as much in this semester. Criterion reference tests are interpreted with regards to a, um, let's say, somewhat arbitrary standard or criterion. So in, in the case of educational testing, you might say that you know, a student is ready to take this particular class if he or she exceeds 65% correct on this screening exam or this entrance exam. That 65% may be um, developed from a large representative sample of students who previously taken the class, in which respect, in, in which case you're talking about a norm reference test, or it could be a somewhat arbitrary criterion that you made up. Like I think a student ought to know better than half or be, better than 65% of the material before she goes on to the next class. That would be that second example there, a criterion referenced test. And criterion reference tests are important. Uh, they're done a lot in uh, educational screening and testing. Um, that's not really the focus of this class, so I'm not going to talk about them a lot, although I probably will touch upon them a few times across uh, Unit 2, likely. Okay, so a, a last point maybe to make before finishing up this one portion of the lecture is this distinction between testing and assessment. I've kind of jumped back and forth or flip-flopped between these two terms throughout this lecture. I probably will throughout future lectures in this class, but just to be clear, um, testing is the actual act of the measuring, the administering and the scoring of particular tests, and we might um, Dis imagine this or describe this as a relatively um, objective process. You know, you're supposed to administer the test the way you were trained based on the test manual. You're supposed to score it likewise based on how the manual said you were supposed to score it. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying there's no skill or no art involved in being a good test administrator, but it's fairly straightforward. It's fairly cut and dry. Assessment is the interpretation of the results of that one test, or often more than one test, the knitting together, or the integrating of different pieces of information from test results, from observations, and so on. And this is a somewhat subjective process. Two uh, psychologists looking at the same set of test results might come to somewhat different assessments of a particular client or a particular student. Um, there is some art to this. And um, in the scope of this class, I'm not going to talk a great deal about that, but in the last unit, Unit 4, we will talk a little bit about how to bring together information from different tests different uh, to create an assessment, to create an integrated report for a particular client. Okay, so I'm just going to pause here for a second and have another sip of tea. Ah, much better. And in the last portion of this class, I'm going to talk a little bit about some different types of tests and then some uses of testing. We're, we're almost done here. So if you've made it this far, thanks for your patience. Uh, this is a long lecture. It looks like we're clocking in already over one hour. Uh, so take some breaks if you need to. Uh, I will, I suppose. Uh, not all the lectures will be this long, don't worry. Types of tests. So uh, a first distinction that we might make is between individual and group tests. Individual tests are tests which are administered one-on-one. -on -one. There's one test administrator and one test taker. And these are most of the tests that we're going to think about in this class. Uh, most of the kind of classic psychological tests are given by one psychologist to one client or one student, and they're evaluated that way. Uh, with respect to norms, but but with you know in one a one-off case with one one client, um, 
As distinct from that are group tests. These are the tests which probably most of us are actually more familiar with from our own experience. Tests which are given to large groups of people at the same time. So when you took the SAT or the ACT or the GRE, um, you were taking a group test. Um, these are somewhat easier to administer because, of course, you just develop a set of questions and you put it online or you administer on pa paper and pencil to a large room full of people. Um, there's less of the, of the skill of being a test administrator um, involved. Uh, you don't need to manipulate particular items or, or set up different sorts of puzzles for a person. Um, we will talk a little bit about group testing in Unit 2, but not as much. I mean, most of the tests that psychologists do are individual tests. Group testing is more common in educational settings, and it is important, but it's not really the focus so much of this class. So again, focusing mostly on individual tests, uh, one type of test we are going to look at, um, as I've already kind of said earlier on in this lecture, are ability tests. Um, the word ability, meaning you know, intellectual ability, is, is often used somewhat synonymously with intelligence. Uh, ability tests or intelligence tests typically um, are sets of rather heterogeneous items or um, you know, a, a heterogeneous sample of of <clears throat> different types of items which are scored up and combined to yield a, an overall measure of intellectual ability. So if you um, <clears throat> if you've ever taken an intelligence test like a, a Wexler or a Stanford Binet, you, you may re recollect that you answered different types of questions, you know, some math questions, some word problem type questions, um, and so on. And whether you know it or not, those questions were scored up and those scores were kind of combined to yield one estimate of your overall intellectual ability. Um, now, to be fair, there are also some ways in the Wexler system uh, and also the Stanford Binet system to yield sub factors or sub scores underneath or that are part of that overall ability. But the basic idea of an ability test is there's one overall resource of intellectual ability that we're trying to measure. Somewhat distinct from that are aptitude tests. Aptitude tests are relatively or consist of relatively homogeneous items which are focused on one particular type of ability or skill. So we might have a, a reading aptitude test or a math aptitude test. And if you think about it, you probably took these likely in group format earlier on in your schooling. You maybe had like a math aptitude test in high school or in grade school. Uh, the idea here isn't so much to assess your overall intellectual ability, uh, but rather your particular ability or your strength or your weakness within some focal area, uh, your ability to read or your ability to do math and so on. Further, somewhat distinct from these are so-called achievement tests. Uh, these are also uh, made up of relatively homo homogeneous items, which yield a score about a particular area. But these areas are uh, closely associated with established content areas in usually education. So things like math or writing or science. Uh, there are achievement tests to measure your achievement in mathematics, your achievements in, in language and writing and so on. Um, at this point, you may be scratching your head slightly and thinking like, wait, what's the difference between in ability or intelligence and aptitude and achievement? Um, the distinctions between these three types of tests are often uh, more about how they're used than they're about the exact content of the test. So uh, an ability test may have uh, a subsection that measures mathematical ability that might look an awful lot like um, a, the items on a math aptitude test, which might look a lot like the items on a math achievement test. Um, there's a certain amount of uh, interpretation here as to whether we're looking at your overall ability, your relative potential or ability within an area, or your relatively established knowledge within that same area. And if that seems a bit fuzzy to you, it is, frankly, but it's also some, a distinction that we'll dig into a little bit in Unit 2. Now, we won't talk about them a lot in this class. Uh, I had to cut, the, cut them out for time reasons, uh, 
but we will talk a little bit about creativity and if you're enrolled in the class if you've purchased the textbook there's a whole chapter on creativity testing um, creativity testing is interesting um, of course because uh, I think most of us are just kind of naturally interested in the idea of creativity Probably most of us like to think of ourselves as creative people. Creativity is difficult to describe or define, but it seems to involve uh, the ability to solve problems in new ways or some aspects or qualities of expression, maybe especially artistic or aesthetic expression. Um, traditionally, creativity is not something that a lot of psychologists have focused on. It's been maybe more the province of educators, but relatively recently in history, positive psychology, the positive psychology movement has attracted a fair bit of interest uh, around the idea of measuring creativity, studying creativity, and so on. Um, a question that to my mind is still left somewhat unanswered by much of this testing is the, the extent to which creativity is distinct from intelligence. Is it the case that intelligence um, or the, the ability to solve problems in new ways or express yourself in new ways, which are the hallmarks, let's say, of creativity, are themselves just facets or aspects of being intelligent. Um, again, we're not going to talk about that too much in this class just because I didn't have time. I had to cut out some lectures this year, but I will try and touch upon it a little bit. And um, I will encourage you, if you're at all interested in this, to look through the textbook and read the chapter on creativity testing. It is very interesting. And if you don't have the time to read the chapter or if you're not enrolled in the class and but you're just still a little bit curious, here's an example of a creativity type problem that you might find on a creativity test. So here is a uh, piece of paper, let's say, with nine dots on it and I might give it to you and as, uh, as the test administrator, I might give this piece of paper to you, the test taker, and say, I want you to connect all those dots using as few straight lines as possible. You might think about that for a second. I'll give you a piece of a pencil or pen and you go to work. Now it's possible if I did this uh, with several different people, I'd get different types of responses. For instance, I might get a response like person A who's you know drawn a kind of a triangle with a, a, a line going off that connects all the dots with one, two, three, four different lines. I might get someone who kind of angles their lines a little bit and is able to connect all of them, all the dots that is, with three lines, one, two, three. I might even get someone who very cleverly folds the paper so as to superposition uh, the dots and then draws one line down all of them. And maybe that last answer, C, is more creative than B, and maybe B is more creative than A. You know, we could probably debate this a little bit and it would have to do with our understanding of the construct of creativity and how that it relates to other constructs, particularly intelligence. But that's an example of a creativity item which you might find on some of the tests of creativity which exist. So again, not going to talk too much about creativity, but it's worth understanding a little bit. Also, uh, there are out there personality tests. We will talk about those a little bit. Personality uh, tests typically try to summarize uh, levels of traits that characterize an individual. Uh, usually these are traits which are thought to or which are empirically established to predict future behavior, your tendency to be open to new ideas or extroverted or neurotic or so on. Um, somewhat related are uh, interest inventories, in inventories which Sam, uh, you know, sort of measure your levels of interest in particular ideas or area, uh, areas of study or areas of activity. Um, these are sometimes used to inform occupational choices. You might take a, the, a, an inventory of occupational interests to su suggest what sort of career you might go into or career you might be well suited for. And as I already described a little bit earlier in this lecture, there are neuropsychological tests. These are tests which help us to uh, characterize or summarize different aspects of brain functioning and are often used to assist with diagnosis of brain dysfunction. So nowadays, uh, because of the aging population, because of the ongoing uh, wars and the, uh, the numbers of veterans who have been injured in bomb blasts or explosions, because of people who have been injured playing sports like football. There's a lot of interest and concern about uh, brain damage, traumatic, traumatic brain injury, 
um, because of the aging population there's also concern about just people are living longer and so they're living into ages where they might have um, deficits in brain function that could be related to areas uh, to areas of ability like memory or attention or so on neuropsych testing is has been a very active area of work for a long time but is if anything is becoming more active as time goes by for all of those reasons so those are just some different types of tests there are certainly others that we could talk about those are just some of the ones I sort of thought of as I was composing this lecture let's talk briefly as I finish up this lecture on the uses of testing I've already kind of argued that testing is ubiquitous or nearly ubiquitous that's important I've highlighted some different types of tests I've thrown in a few cautions about testing um, what is it that we use testing for um, briefly here are some ideas well we use testing for classification so if we're trying to place people into a program of education or a program of work based on their skills or based on their needs testing can be really valuable you know, we want to for instance find students who may benefit from additional help in their reading and give them reading classes we might find students who are really good at math and give them additional training so that they can benefit or expand their knowledge um, we might want to fit people into jobs where they're well suited based on their interests or their abilities you know some of the earliest examples of psychological testing and we'll see this in future lectures but some of the earliest examples of psychological testing had to do with this idea of placing people into spots that they either could benefit from or uh, or would uh, or would be a benefit to relatedly there's the idea of screening so can we screen people um, to uh, can we screen people to measure uh, whether or not they are uh, likely to have a particular disorder or benefit from a particular type of treatment are they is someone at risk for developing uh, cancer is someone at risk for suicide is someone um, likely to benefit from uh, additional treatment and so on testing can play a role in diagnosis um, clearly uh, you know many of the problems that people in clinical psychology and related fields work with are, are things which are relatively abstract or non-concrete things like depression schizophrenia it's anxiety etc so making diagnoses determining levels of symptom presentation involve careful testing classifying behaviors etc uh, assessment can also be used with treatment planning you know planning trying to determine the best treatment for a particular disorder or a particular presentation can be informed by assessment ideally you know what we'd like to see is a situation in which a clinician conducts an assessment arrives at a diagnosis hopefully the correct diagnosis for a particular uh, patient and then is able to implement the best recommended treatment for that diagnosis probably doesn't always work out as smoothly as we would like or as smoothly as uh, depicted with this arrow diagram but something like that could be very uh, would be ideal for most clinical settings and an example of how assessment and testing is useful testing can also be used for program evaluation you know, so if you're trying to determine whether a particular a particular prevention program or intervention program is successful um, testing can play a role is uh, is head start effective for uh, decreasing the gap between uh, you know low performing students and high performing students in terms of basic education is a particular university's um, anti-drug and anti-alcohol abuse program effective at decreasing the rates of alcohol abuse or drug abuse um, etc these are uh, policy these are often policy concerns which can be evaluated at least in part with testing um, and so that can be really important as well um, research there are countless applications for research for assessment in research clearly um, we uh, you know could go on talking a, a, about that a lot um, I'm sure most of you have done research are already aware of all the ways that assessment is important for measuring the different variables that you study to evaluate the theories that you're interested in okay so having talked about some examples of how or given some examples of how testing is used and having talked about a variety of other topics for well over an hour now I'm happy to say that I'm finishing up here's a quick preview of what I'll cover in my next lecture 
Um, I'll talk a little bit about ethics basically and standards. I'll talk about professional testing standards, the responsibilities that test producers and publishers uh, have, the responsibility that test users have, meaning the people uh, like us, psychologists and other professionals who use tests, the responsibilities that we have. Um, I'll talk a little bit and I'll talk about this later in the semester, but I'll talk a little bit about some of the issues that come up with testing members of minority populations and how we need to be especially careful when we use our tests so as to not um, arrive at results which are biased or otherwise problematic. So that's a bit of a preview. Um, I'll see you soon if you're in my class or I'll be back and you'll see my next lecture very soon as soon as I record it. Thanks so much for paying attention. That's all for this lecture. Again, thank you for paying attention. Um, if you have a moment, uh, make yourself a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, relax, think about what you've learned. Hopefully it'll make sense to you. If you have questions, ask me either in class or through Blackboard, or if you're not enrolled in the class, just through the comments area in YouTube, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. Thanks so much.